Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're living in a very exciting time where AI truly has the potential to transform all industries. And we not only get to be a part of it, we get to drive it. And this technology is being adopted at an unprecedented rate. In my role, I'm very fortunate to get to talk to a lot of customers. And one of the key things that they ask is, there's a lot of hype around generative AI, but what's truly going to add value to my business? And what should I consider in formulating my AI roadmap? And that's what Keelan and I will present on today. So first, we'll touch on customer examples of where they saw value from AI, and then we'll go into these five considerations, which are how do you select your use cases? How do you create a culture of <coughs> experimentation, measurement, and improvement, security, privacy, and responsible AI, and then finally, putting machine learning models in production at scale. I'm Donna, I lead the technical solutions management team for generative AI and large scale machine learning. And our team builds AI solutions using Google Cloud products. And my co-presenter is Keelan. Hi everyone, my name is Keelan McDonald. I'm a product manager on Vertex Generative AI. And I'll be returning in just a moment to just talk a little bit about experimentation, measurement and responsible AI. But first, Donna is gonna take us through some customer use cases. All right, so to start with the business value that AI can create. <clears throat> Typically, companies look to improve either an existing workflow, this might be a rules-based engine, for example, or solve a new problem that couldn't be solved before, maybe just due to the sheer amount of data. So I'll give three examples. First, a large consumer packaged good company is using AI to get new insights. In the past, the product composition of vending machines was determined by their sales representatives <coughs> based off of their experience and intuition. But the company wanted to take a more data-driven approach. So they built a platform to predict the performance of hundreds of thousands of vending machines, and it led to new discoveries that couldn't be seen on a map alone. So for example, the model predicted a location which you know, seemed not to be useful, but then when they went there, they found out it's actually a gathering spot and it turned out to be a great location for a vending machine. Second, employee productivity. So a digital native that creates personalized experiences for millions of buyers around the world using state-of-the-art search, uh, recommendations, and ads, uh, move to Vertex, our end-to-end -end machine learning platform. And in doing so, their data scientists and engineers were able to carry out twice as many experiments, and they can prototype new architectures in a matter of days instead of weeks. And finally, innovation. A large pharmaceutical company is exploring how AlphaFold on Vertex can help the company more accurately predict protein structure predictions, minimizing the high ratio of failure from more traditional methods and speeding up the ability for researchers to conduct experiments on Google Cloud. And this, in turn, will accelerate the drug discovery process. So now I'm going to show you a prototype that my team built in a matter of weeks using Google Cloud products like BigQuery, Looker, Vertex AI, with an open source UI framework. And it demonstrates how developers can use generative AI in enterprise applications, in this case, to support a marketing team. And it was built with three personas in mind. Um, so let me try to use a pointer here. It was built for Mary the analyst, uh, who wants to get insights from disparate data sources, for Chow, a content creator, who wants to create content uh, for multiple di digital channels, and then Amani, who is a campaign manager who uh, is responsible for formulating, building campaigns, and then also optimizing campaigns. And together, this team has been tasked with launching a campaign for a new men's shoe line at Symbol Retail. All right, so first they're going to create the uh, campaign brief and campaign folder for Symbol Retail, the new men's shoe line, 
They have their targeting inputs, in this case men between the ages of 30 and 40, with the objective to drive awareness. And you can, what you see here is that Vertex Palm 2 is actually generating the brief. And you can see the budget, timeline, call to action, communication channels. And then this can then be exported for further collaboration and editing before it gets sent. For Mary, the analyst will show how she can get analytics and insights. So first, um, there's a variety of ways to build marketing data foundations on Google Cloud, and she explores uh, her Looker dashboards as a single source of truth across CRM data, for example, analytics data, and uh, website data. And she might also have some predictive models, for example, for her audiences. In this case, she wants to see the propensity to purchase predictions. She can explore them. And here you can see a variety, the cohorts that were generated using BigQuery machine learning. Next, she might have some more questions about her audiences. And so she previews the data within BigQuery and she has some questions that she wants to see. So she's going to ask for the customer emails ordered by some of transactions. And now you'll see that uh, Cody is actually generating the code, executing it, and also returning a result. And so this really assists her in her ability to analyze data. So next, trend spotting. This is the public Google Trends data set that you can see. And she wants to see what are the top search terms on a specific date. So here she looks specifically for the 18th, gets eagles, or she may want to summarize news using large language models. In this case, the keyword is fashion, and you see the title and summary returned. And lastly, she wants consumer insights, in this case, the retail trends for 2023. And you can see the Think with Google results returned. It could also be consumer reports, and this is powered by Vertex Search. Next, Chow wants to create content across a multitude of different channels. He starts with email copy, and in this case, it's based off of the insights from Mary the analyst. So he's going to generate a few samples just to experiment and see. And you'll see that the text, again, is being generated using Vertex Palm 2 and the images using Imagine. And their email has been generated as well as translated to the preferred language from the data that you saw earlier. But probably you don't want to do this one by one, and so you can also do this in bulk, either based off of cohort information or audience information. And here you can see the emails again being generated using Vertex foundational models. And then it's submitted to the campaign folder. Next, Chow creates a website post. Again, the text generated using Palm 2, and then different images using Imagine. Chow selects the one that he likes, and then adds it to the campaign folder. Next, he wants to create the social media post, so he's going to create a post for threads. Again, the same target audience. In this case, he doesn't need an image, so he decides not to generate an image. and a post for th thread is created, added to the campaign folder. Next child creates an Instagram post, and maybe in this case he doesn't want to generate images. He already has an image that he has at hand that he likes, so he decides to upload it instead. The text is generated for Instagram, and then he uploads an image of leather shoes. But sometimes you get different insights, right? Sometimes consumer reports show a different color works better. And so maybe he wants black leather shoes instead. And so he can actually edit the image for black leather shoes. And it doesn't have to be that the color of the shoes is changing. The background could change or additional things could be added to the image itself. And you can see here that the image was edited. We add it again to the Instagram post and then to the campaign folder. And then Chow creates assets for Performance Max, a Google Ads AI-powered campaign. It's generating the headlines, description, call to action, images, and then added to the campaign folder. And then all of this is shared with Amani, who builds the campaigns and is optimizing it, and she can review it. So 
She looks at the campaign folder. All of the available assets are shown. She can see the text, edit the text, double click on the images to see if she's happy before she activates it, in this case to Google Ads or across a variety of channels. She can upload all of the assets generated to Google Drive to be able to store and organize it, and then also share and collaborate, and also generate slides, as well as docs for further collaboration, assisted by Duet AI. And you can see the presentation here, as well as the creative brief that was created. And then Amani wants to optimize a campaign performance, so she actually sees the same single source of truth dashboards that uh, Mary the analyst sees. She wants to understand what are the best practices for performance max, so she uh, asks the ads helper. And this is powered by Vertex Conversation. And here it returns an answer as well as a link with more information. Maybe she also has some questions on Instagram, and so she's asking how to optimize reach and again, it returns a result. And so with this, the team was able to launch the campaign in a matter of days instead of months. And if you're a developer and you're interested, uh, we actually released the source code on GitHub for you to get started. So how do you get started with your AI roadmap? It starts with use case prioritization. Based on our experience, we'd recommend looking at three things. The first is business impact, and this very often comes down to the bottom line, either increasing revenue or decreasing costs. It could be more indirect, for example, like boosting employee productivity. So you might want to look for a use case where there's a lot of manual overhead, a lot of repetitive tasks, and then if you solve that problem with AI, then it'll make the work for that employee more interesting, for example, more creative, more strategic, and could help reduce attrition. It should be a use case as well that has enough business impact to show value, but also not so critical that it becomes a really big risk. Ease of implementation, which impacts the time to market, often depends on the availability and readiness of data, as well as the difficulty of the methodology used. A new project or one that's in a proof of concept stage might be easier than one that's already in production. And then lastly, the capabilities built, and this one often gets forgotten. So we'd encourage you to look at a use case which is maybe a repeatable pattern across the business. So for example, maybe you have propensity models that you could use within each region, as well as the technical capabilities that you're building. So for example, if you're continuous training or continuous monitoring capabilities that would apply to multiple different use cases. And in doing this, it's very critical to bring together the business stakeholders as well as the technical stakeholders to define the use cases as well as what success looks like. However, you can't plan for everything, uh, especially in such a quickly moving field. And therefore, it's critical to experiment and iterate. And with that, I'll hand over to Keelan. All right, so experimentation is hard. Uh, it's probably not a stage that anybody looks forward to, but it is essential. So why do we need to experiment when we're building AI products? Typically the reason is because it's hard to get right the first time. And the reality is that with traditional AI products, experimentation was really difficult. You had really long timelines, you needed a lot of data to get started, you needed PhD level experts to iterate on the models. You can see here, there are a lot of stages and each of those stages could be many, many months. So you're looking at a pretty, pretty long roadway until you're getting into production. <clears throat> the good news that I bring to you today is that generative AI has really disrupted the way that we experiment with AI. So you can see here on the chart that the great thing about generative AI is you can get started with very small amounts of data and very powerful pre-trained models. What this means for you, if you're getting started on your AI journey today, is that you don't need long preparation, you don't need large teams of experts, you just need an idea about what you want and the creativity to implement it with some of the tools that we're gonna talk about today. 
All right, so what does it mean to experiment with a foundation model? There's a few different paradigms that you can think about when it comes to experimenting with foundation models. So the first one is using fully fine-tuned models, so experimenting with different tuned models. So these are models that are designed to do a specific task like image generation, translation, chat, some of the instances that Donna just showed you. The nice thing about these pre-trained models is that if you have a specific workload that you want to run, you can just try lots of different models that are available on Vertex. So an example of this might be, let's say you had a bunch of images and you wanted to uh, detect whether a car was in the image. You could browse through Vertex, find a number of different vision models, run those workloads against those vision models, and see which ones have the best outcome for your use case. The second way that you can experiment with LLMs is through parameter-efficient fine-tuning. So when you hear the word tuning, you might think big data sets to retune or fine-tune a, a model. But with parameter-efficient fine-tuning, you're actually just feeding it a couple hundred prompts to get started. So this tuning has very low overhead. You're just creating an adapter layer in front of the model. And it helps you to experiment very, very quickly for your use case. <clears throat> And then perhaps easiest of all is just simply refining your prompts. So Donna just showed a great use case of an instance where we were using prompts to create different types of content. And you could see that those prompts were just simple sentences or requests to the model. If you're operating in that paradigm, just adjusting the language that you're using to prompt the model can often drive very, very different results. All right. So it, Rapid iteration is possible with generative AI. So this is a really new paradigm for the world of AI ML. Um, and the best way to think about this is that you can start by adapting foundation models with uh, adapter tuning or fine tuning. So these are easy ways for you to tune the model for your specific use case. Of course, if you're thinking more at the product level and you want to understand if the output of the model is resonating with your audience, uh, you can also implement A-B testing for your products, whether your users or customers or your own employees. And then finally, you're going to want to compare and measure the results against your traditional workflows and processes. So as Donna pointed out earlier, a lot of times AI use cases are either replacing existing work workflows or augmenting those workflows. So you're, wanting to, you're going to want to make sure that whatever results that you get from your experimentation have comparable, ideally better results from whatever traditional software paradigms that you're using. All right, so you've done some experimentation and now you've got a lot of data, hopefully. <laughs> the next phase here is gonna be measuring the output of your experiments and actually driving improvement in your models and your AI solutions. So there's a few different uh, steps to think about in terms of measurement. Um, number one is accuracy. And so this is a tricky topic uh, with generative AI compared to traditional AI, which was more deterministic. But when you think of accuracy, you really want to think about grounding in the truth of what your goals are. So obviously accuracy for creative marketing content might be a little bit different than accuracy for um, obtaining facts or doing a certain type of summarization of business docs. So you're going to want to define what accuracy means for your use case. Number two is business impact. So is this solution impactful to your business? Does it truly solve a problem, improve a process, add revenue, lower costs, all those kinds of things? Um, for every use case, those, those goals might be very different, but you're gonna wanna make sure that you have those defined so that when you get that data from your experimentation, you can compare those results. And then finally, efficiency. So obviously one of the magical things about AI is that it does things quickly and at um, really astronomical scale compared to a lot of human processes, but you wanna make sure that whatever your AI solution is, it makes sense for your business from a cost efficiency perspective. So um, all of these jobs uh, you know, require different types of scale. You're gonna to wanna to make sure to understand that your solution fits into that framework for you. All right, so. There is a path of measurement along AI model development, and I wanted to spend a minute to just take you through this path. It looks a little scary because there are several different stops along the way, but the good news is that each of these steps are pretty well defined and pretty easy to follow if you know what you're looking for. So the first thing, obviously, as we talked about, is picking 
a pre-trained model. And if you're experimenting, you're obviously probably gonna pick a few models to compare. Number two is gonna be tuning so that you can compare the results of your base model with the results of your tuned model. Number three is gonna be that optimization step. So you see the data, you compare it to the benchmarks that you want and you continue to tune or swap out new models until you get the results that your business use case needs. Validate, so again, going back to that accuracy step, making sure that you're getting what you want based on the metrics that you've defined for your particular use case. And then finally, you're ready to deploy your model. Now, I wanna say that it ends at deployment, but there is one more step, which is once a model's in production, you wanna have ongoing maintenance and monitoring. Luckily, Vertex makes that super easy, but one of the things that's important about deploying a machine learning model, whether it's generative AI or traditional AI, is that you wanna make sure that you have that monitoring in place so that you don't get um, undiagnosed skew or drift from your results. All right, so I wanna acknowledge that Gen AI evaluation can be challenging. So as magical as uh, some of these LLMs are, um, we're still in a world where the metrics around Gen AI accuracy are being defined. So I wanna kind of recommend a couple steps for you to be more successful with your Gen AI evaluation. So number one is identify the data that you're actually testing with. So um, I started this presentation by bringing you the good news that you no longer need you know, massive data sets to train models, and that is absolutely true. But you do need some test data so that you can compare the results in the models, either compare base model results with fine-tuned results, or compare the results of other processes you've used in the past with the results of the LLMs. Um, and again, uh, you don't have to have that massive data set, but you do wanna have a data set to test with so that you know your results are in line with your, out, with your uh, outcome desired. Number two, define your metrics. And again, this is one where um, there's a little bit more onus on the user than on tr from uh, traditional ML paradigms. And that's really because, as I mentioned earlier, the metrics are still being defined in this space. So generative AI is starting to kind of coalesce towards some common metrics, such as Rouge for summarization. But for many uh, types of content that generative AI is gonna produce, there are no particular uh, uh, industry-leading paradigms for evaluation. So a good example would be, how do you know if a marketing blog is, is good, right? There's a lot of human evaluation and human judgment in that, and it's gonna differ from use case to user to company based off of the outcomes, the audience, all sorts of different things. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you define that upfront as part of your experimentation so that when you have that data, you can really measure it accurate, accurately. And then finally, narrow your decision space. Um, it can be very easy to be overwhelmed by just the sheer amount of things that you can measure, uh, things that you can, uh, you, you can benchmark against with these models. Um, as you probably are well aware, there are a lot of new models in the world and they're doing very exciting things. That being said, you wanna be strict about defining that decision space so that you don't get kind of stuck in analysis paralysis. Um, you'll know your business, you'll know your use case, make sure to keep that uh, decision space tight and it'll help you iterate as quickly as you need to. All right, and then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about security, privacy, and responsibility. So this is not unique to AI, this is foundational obviously to all software development, but with AI comes uh, you know, different sorts of considerations when it comes to privacy and responsibility. All right. So you're, you're on the fourth step here. You've identified an amazing use case. You've done your experimentation. You've done your measurement. You're ready to deploy. This is fantastic. But you have to make sure that you have the right security posture and the right responsible AI posture. Um, for us at Google Cloud, that spans from data governance to security compliance and support to reliability and sustainability, and then, of course, to responsible AI. So the good news is that as a Google Cloud customer, you are inheriting those uh, standards from us as your infrastructure provider. We are partners in this journey to provide safe and secure AI. Um, that being said, there are some steps that you'll also need to take um, and to implement your solution. And we'll talk a little bit about what that partnership looks like in the next slide here. All right. So as I mentioned, the good news is that, that responsibility in the AI space is a shared responsibility between Cloud and our customers. Um, and so when you build your solutions on Google Cloud or you use Google Cloud AI services, we're gonna share that security responsibility with you. 
And so really what that means is that we're gonna be responsible for the security and safety and responsible AI positioning of the underlying infrastructure. And what we're gonna ask you to do is be responsible for creating secure configurations, making sure that you have data protection in place, and of course, making sure that access, access permissions and other access or other aspects of maintaining your environment are all properly implemented. And um, we do have a lot of learning and, and other enablement materials if you're working on, on uh, figuring that out for your own projects. Um, but, but you as the owner of your projects ultimately are the owner of those security policies. And so we call this a shared fate model and we take it very seriously by really trying to be a full partner in this process. And so what that really means is that we've come up with a framework called Secure AI Framework, aka SAFE, um, which is a conceptual framework for securing AI systems. It's, in, it's inspired by security-led practices common to all software development, so things like reviewing, testing, and controlling the supply chain, and Google applies this across our software stack, but it also incorporates some of the broader trends that are very specific to risks that are associated with AI systems. So a framework like SAFE ensures that when AI models are implemented, they're secure by default. And so what that means is that um, in order to make them unsecure, you have to undo settings that Google provides to you. So you can build secure, private AI applications without expending a ton of resources, knowing that these secure by default policies are in place. But of course, I've just run you through a number of different policies and recommended a number of different practices. You're probably wondering, how do I do this at scale? Um, and that's where MLOps come in, comes in. So with that, Donna is gonna help us wrap up on the fifth step of MLOps. MLOps really enables you to increase velocity, reduce the cost, and manage risk at scale. As most of you know, it includes orchestrating and automating the execution of continuous training pipelines, model deployment and prediction serving, data set and feature management, and then model management and governance. And a few years ago, we published the Practitioner's Guide to MLOps, which outlines the core processes and capabilities. But what's new since? Now with generative AI, organizations will need to evolve their MLOps capabilities to address new challenges. It's still early days for generative AI, but we'll share a little bit about what we're seeing and some additional considerations in this space. So to customize models for their use cases, organizations will need to adapt foundational models to their task, as Keelan showed earlier, and they'll likely use prompt engineering. This gives rise to a need for prompt evaluation, prompt management processes, as well as artifact management for in-context learning. Currently, we still see pretty much an experimental approach being applied to other, uh, other methods of model adaptation, like model tuning or reinforcement learning from human feedback, which entails incorporating human feedback to customize and improve model performance. If you think back, this is very similar to the early stages of traditional machine learning workflow implementations before the introduction of frameworks like TFX and Kubeflow. And we expect MLOps for generative AI to evolve in a similar way. As Keelan indicated earlier, we'll need to evolve how we evaluate machine learning models and manage AI infrastructure given the computationally intensive nature of these workloads. And this is where uh, our TPUs and NVIDIA's GPUs, like the A100s and H100s, really shine. And given the scale, cost management will also become more important. Distillation, where a smaller model learns from a larger model, will likely become an important aspect of uh, preparing models for efficient deployment and serving. Other areas of exploration are how to get the same quality results from a smaller model and how to lower the cost of running them. And then organizations are also recognizing that they need additional guardrails on top of traditional model monitoring, such as safety filters, safety scores, recitation checks, data loss prevention, 
They need to monitor the generated output and connect to enterprise data. And as these trends continue to advance and other trends emerge, organizations will need to build on their existing MLOps investments and tooling to better accommodate these new techniques. And I'd highly recommend watching the session tomorrow, Building Your MLOps Strategy for Generative AI by Mikael and Irena. So now bringing it all together. A customer that's done these five considerations is Jasper. So they built a SaaS application on Google Cloud that aims to be the AI co-pilot for marketers. They fine-tune Vertex Palm models for marketing content generation and enable users to further customize outputs based off of their brand voice. They adjust output quality based off of constant user feedback, and they benefit from the security of Google Cloud and Vertex, and their SaaS application is also enterprise ready with SOC 2 and GDPR compliance. Uh, furthermore, their AI engine manages model fitting and training at scale, and so their customers don't need to worry about MLOps pipelines. And so their customers have seen value through, first of all, increased velocity of content creation, increased engagement on that content, and then an overall cost reduction. Luckily, they're also one of our generative AI partners, so if you don't want to build all of this yourself, you can buy an off-the-shelf solution or work with one of our many other great AI partners. Now, to get started, you can take the AI Readiness Quick Check tool. Uh, it's based off of our AI adoption framework and enables you to assess your capabilities along six dimensions. Lead, learn, access secure, scale, and automate. So if you scan the QR code, you can uh, take the assessment. It will take probably only around 15 minutes and will also give you some recommendations for next steps. And to wrap up and conclude, I'll hand over to Keelan for more resources. I think I might have lost, there we go. <laughs> Speaking of learning, um, I have a few resources I'd like to point you to today. Um, so number one is our Cloud Skills Boost page. Um, this is a freely available learning platform uh, created by Google Cloud. It has a number of courses or you can take ad hoc uh, learning sessions, but it's a super, way, super helpful way to get started with AI specifically or with generative AI uh, more recently. And we also have published another uh, number of reference architectures and code samples to help you as a developer get started as well. Two, explore. So anybody with a Google Cloud account has access today to Generative AI Studio, which is our UI for uh, prototyping, UI, prototyping generative AI solutions. So if you're interested in experimenting with the Palm model that uh, Donna mentioned earlier, if you're interested in experimenting with Imagine, you can go there today and start prompting in the, um, in the UI. And then finally, deploy. If you're a little bit farther along on your journey and you, you know what you want to build, we have a few uh, opportunities for you to do that today. Um, if you're ready to go fast, uh, we have out-of-the-box solutions around Vertex search and conversation. Or if you'd like to work with a partner, as Donna mentioned, we have a number of AI specialized partners that can help you get going as quickly as you need to. Finally, um, obviously you're all here at Next, so you're interested in learning more about Google Cloud and Google Cloud AI. So there's a number of solutions that build on some of the content and themes that Donna and I discussed today. So these are a few of the ones that we'd recommend. Um, common business use cases for generative AI is especially a good one to step up from some of the more general learnings uh, that we covered in the slides today. All right, and then finally, we'd love your feedback. So um, please do uh, visit our uh, session page in the mobile app and give feedback. Um, always trying to uh, improve for next 24, so we'd love to hear what you thought of our session.